Hello everyone, welcome to this video. In this video, we shall be starting with another topic involving operator equations. So let's begin with the story of compact linear operators. So we already know that if we have T defined from the normed space X to the normed space X, this is defined to be a compact linear operator. This is defined to be a compact linear operator on the normed space x and parallel to this we have another operator t cross if you, if you remember this operator is defined on the, the uh, dual space of the normed space x to the dual space of the normed space x this is defined to be the adjoint operator of the compact linear operator t adjoint operator of the operator t and if lambda which is some complex number and is given to be non-zero this thing is given to us and we are saying we are fixing this for certain operator t then we can combine the concept of linear integral equations with that of operator equations which are defined for a given compact linear operator. So this thing in the very starting was suggested that was suggested by the very famous Fred Holm right when he uh, he was studying about linear integral equations he suggested that the concept of linear integral equations could be associated with that of operation uh, operator equations which uh, came as a result when uh, of studying this compact linear operators and moreover how we can solve these kind of equations so how we can solve them there the concept of solvability of these equations was it was given by Ries in the year 1918. So here our aim is first of all uh, uh, to study that what are these equations. So first of all we'll uh, study this and next we'll see how we can solve such equations right so these uh, you'll be getting the answer of these two questions in this video so let's move forward so here first of all let me first uh, define the operator equations that we have with us so we have four operator equations so first of all we have tx minus lambda x that is equal to y so here notice that what was t t was a compact operator defined from the normed space x to the normed space x so that means the small x is some member of the normed space capital x lambda is already fixed to us for a given compact operator and what is y y is also certain member of the normed space x and lambda non-zero is given to us so that means we have fixed this lambda here so let's mark this as equation number one now corresponding to corresponding to equation one we have a homogeneous counterpart homogeneous counterpart of equation one which is nothing but we, we are uh, keeping this right hand side as 0. So we have Tx minus lambda x that is equal to 0. So this is the homogeneous counterpart for the equation number 1. So let me call this here. The condition is that this lambda is not equal to 0. So here this is the equation number 2. And if you see what is this? Uh, this is Tx is equal to lambda x. So this was if the operator T is linear and defined for the finite dimensional norm space in that case this is nothing but the eigenvalue uh, eigenvector 
an eigenvalue equation, right? Okay, so let's not move there. So this is our equation 2 and corresponding to this uh, for the adjoint operator, we have two more equations. So the next equation is T cross defined on F minus lambda of F, this is equal to G. Where what is G? G is some functional which is taken from the dual space of X. And here, uh, this lambda non-zero is given to us. This is some complex number. So here you see the joint operator works on only the functionals which are taken from the dual space of the X. And so let me mark this as equation 3 and corresponding to equation 3, corresponding to equation 3, the homogeneous counterpart is that the homogeneous counterpart is the next equation which is nothing but t cross f by this lambda f that is equal to 0. So that means again we are keeping the right hand side here as equal to 0. So let's mark this as equation 4. So these are the four equations that we shall be looking further and we our aim would be this is the first equation, second equation, third equation and fourth equation and our aim would be how we can solve these equations. So let me write down how we can solve these equations and even before uh, studying how we can solve these equations, let's first ponder on this question. So we have this question which says why first of all why should we consider these equations and study them all together. So the answer here is that all of these four equations, all four equations, they are interrelated to each other, right? So uh, studying one implies the solution of second, third and fourth and so on. So that means studying all of these together gives us a better insight into the solvability of these operator equations and moreover I have told you uh, the study of these equations lead us to the study of linear integral equation which could be made easy using uh, by studying these equations and these linear integral equations are nothing but a consequence of modeling of certain physical phenomena. So that is why studying these operator equations is also quite important. Okay, so after that, if that is the case, so what could we say about the solution? So what's the solution to these operator equations. So that is the question here. So here, uh, in order to see what's the solution, let me first write down everything. What is the solution and how we can proceed. So here, if you see equation 1 is normally sol solvable. So what was the equation 1? t of x minus lambda of x is equal to y. So this was our equation 1. So we'll say equation 1 is normally solvable. That is normally solvable. So what does that mean? That is equation 1 here has a solution x, has a solution x if and only if if and only if f of y is equal to 0 for all solutions f for all solutions f of equation number 4. So now you see what is the connection here. What was equation 4? It was the homogeneous counterpart for equation number 3. Right? So see the functional that we were taking in the equation 3 and 4. So we are relating the solution of 
this first equation with that of the fourth equation. So we are saying equation one has a solution if and only if when that solution applied on to the functional f gives us zero for every solution f for every here. Note that we are talking about every solution f of equation four. So even if you have f1, f2, f3, f4, so this uh, x would be a solution of equation 1 if and only if the right hand side when substituted in the solution of equation 4 gives us 0, right? So, moreover, we can say that hence if f is equal to 0 is the only solution, if this is the only solution of equation number 4, right, then for every y, the equation 1 is solvable. So that means if we have trivial solution for equation 4, where f is equal to 0 is the only solution of equation 4, then for every y, whichever y we take here, there is no issue, we would certainly have the solution of equation 1. So that means an x would exist in such a case which, which is which would then be the solution of equation number one next result is about equation three we would say equation three what was that equation it was t cross f minus lambda f is equal to g now you should remember all of these equations because we'll be talking more frequently about these equations in this course from now on so we'll say equation 3 that is this equation has a solution this has a solution if and only if g of x is equal to 0 for all solutions for all remember for all solutions x of equation number 2 and what was equation 2 it was t of x minus lambda of x is equal to 0 right so they are saying uh, we have a equation if uh, we have a solution f for the equation 3 whenever the solution of this equation which is x applied on to the right hand side of the equation 3 here g of x is 0 then this equation would have solution for every solution x when we input that to this equation g of x is equal to 0, then this equation would have solution. So in this case, we could say hence, if we only have the trivial solution in this case, that means if x is equal to 0 is the only solution for equation 2 of equation 2, right? then for every g then for every g the equation 3 is solvable if that is so if we x is equal to 0 is only the solution then whichever g you take whichever right hand side you take for of for this equation number 3 we would definitely find a solution for equation 3. You see, the, these all of these results, they are quite strong in nature and they give you a definite idea about the solutions. So, this theory is very uh, important. Next, we, we are saying that equation 1, what, what, what was that? Tx minus lambda x is equal to y. This was the equation 1. This equation has a solution x what was the solution x for every y for every y in capital x if and only if x is equal to 0 is the only solution if this is the only solution of equation 2 right so they are saying we would find a solution x for every y if x is equal to 0 
is the only solution that means if x is equal to 0 is the only solution of equation 2 what was equation 2 tx minus lambda x is equal to 0 right if this is the only solution then we would have a, a solution for every y and if we have a solution for every y x is equal to 0 is the only solution next point is about equation 3 so equation 3 what was that t cross f pi plus lambda of f is equal to g this was equation 3 so we say equation 3 that has a solution equation 3 has a solution f for every g for every g which is some member of the dual space if and only if f is equal to 0 is the only solution if this is the only solution of equation number 4 and what was that t cross f minus lambda of f is equal to 0 right so we are saying equation 3 has a solution f if for every g f is equal to 0 is the only solution for equation number 4 if f is equal to 0 is the only solution for this homogeneous equation then uh, equation 3 would have a solution f for every g which is present in the dual space of the space x next we are saying equation number 2 and equation number 4 they have the same number of they have the same number of linearly independent linearly independent solutions this is also a quite strong result so this result tells you or tells us that the number of solutions for the equation 2 would be same as the number of solutions for equation 4 which are linearly independent because once you have a uh, once you have two or more linearly independent solutions their linear combination would also be a solution to these equations because the, the, this thing we have already studied in our lower classes in linear algebra right and the last thing the last result that tells us that t lambda which is nothing but t minus lambda i this operator satisfies the fred home alternative now what is this and how do we reach at all of these results that is the portion uh, which we shall be studying further in the next videos so to see the answer of the uh, of this how you should proceed on to the next videos this is just the summary and uh, here i have told you what four equations are there which arise from the compact linear operators so that is it for this video thank you for watching